Welcome to Peace United Church of Christ on this June 28th morning. We are an opening, open and affirming congregation as well as when in transition. As many of you know, our interim pastor, Reverend Damian Lake, is heading to Missouri for his new call. Peace is now in search of a bridge and settled pastor. In the meantime, our multi-talented members are stepping up to bring you worship each Sunday. I am the Reverend Beverly Brook, Peace's community pastor, and today I am joined in worship with the amazing musician, Diane Seichel, and our own compassionate chaplain, the Reverend Bonnie Lane. And we are so pleased to welcome all the way from Santa Cruz Garden, the renowned filmmaker, Stu Jenkins. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you all for being here this morning. Now take off your shoes, kick off your sandals, or slip off your bunny slippers, and remember, you are standing on sacred, alone ground. Come and worship God. Is there a spiritual practice more important than listening? It is hard to think of one. We listen to the voice of the Spirit. We listen to our teachers in faith. We listen to our heart when it tells us what to do. We listen to one another. Listening is a core principle to any spirituality, which is why some people want to turn off the listening app within us, especially when encountering a different opinion. To listen is to be fully present. It is an act of confidence in what we believe because it means we are unafraid to learn more. Listening is the first step toward reconciliation and the foundation of community. If we cannot listen, we cannot learn. If we cannot learn, we cannot grow. Listen. Now is the time that we come and gather our children. So if they're in the other room, call them in, have them come on in, so we can have this children's moment. I was going to sit down, but I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to get back up with the camera right on me. So I'm going to just stand right here, maybe move around. So there's been a lot of things on TV recently that seems very violent. And I keep on going back to Jesus' teaching, teachings of nonviolence. So today I thought I would teach you the two hands of nonviolence. And how it goes is like this.
let's say someone is saying something not nice about you. Maybe it's a, a sister or a brother or a friend. What you do is you say, stop. So they stop that, right? But we want to be open as well. So you open up the other hand and you say, that really hurt my feelings, but what's going on with you? So that you can learn what's happening with that person, but they stop bullying me. Now, the other thing is, I've learned that sometimes those voices are in our heads saying bad things about ourselves. That we're not smart enough, or we're not fast enough, or we're not uh, good enough. So sometimes, and I'm not sure how this all works, but you turn the hand toward yourself and you say, stop. Stop saying those bad things about you. You are of value. You are enough. And then open. So why are you feeling that way? Maybe you go to your grown-up and say, you know, I don't think I'm smart enough or pretty enough. And open that hand. Now just imagine if you just put up both hands. Doesn't really give you much, does it? Doesn't open you up. What if you did this? Wow, everything would just come right at you. So this week, practice, maybe with your grown-up. Stop, but I'm open. Try that this week. It's called the two hands of nonviolence. And now we will give you our blessing as you go back to wherever you were, or you can stick around. There's lovely music today. May the peace of God surround you. Like, like the trees towering in the forest. May the peace of God warm you all over. Like the sun shining in the sky. May the peace of God rise and roll over you. Like the waves rolling in the sea. May the peace of God fill you. Like the wind stirring in your soul. May the peace of God surround you. Amen. 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 service today. Now is the time for a celebration of giving and offering of gifts. Our scripture today is the voice of someone who is desperate, asking for help. We've all been there, and some of us are fortunate enough to belong to this blessed community where we support each other through prayers, deep friendships, and loving presence. During our shelter-in-place time, we are reminded that we are the church, and we are here for each other, whether we see each other in real life or not. Our community is vibrant. Right now, our financial contributions are needed as we continue to provide our Sunday worship online, search and find our next settled minister, care for our facilities, and keep our office staffed. Please give as you are able. To do so, your gifts can be received online as a pledge, or please mail to 900 High Street, Santa Cruz, 95060. Thank you so very much for your generosity. And now it's time to hear our ancient story. I invite you to listen with your heart, as Reverend Beverly just talked about, and see what this sacred text is telling each one of us today. This message is from Psalm 13, the Hebrew Bible. The translation is called The Message by Eugene Peterson. And when you listen to these few verses, you will hear three things, complaint, prayer, 
and salvation and comfort. Long enough, God. You've ignored me long enough. I've looked at the back of your head long enough. Long enough I've carried this ton of trouble, lived with a stomach full of pain. Long enough my arrogant enemies have looked down their noses at me. Take a good look at me, God, my God. I want to look life in the eye so no enemy can get the best of me or laugh when I fall on my face. I've thrown myself headlong into your arms. I'm celebrating your rescue. I'm singing at the top of my lungs. I'm so full of answered prayers. Thanks be to God for holy scripture and sacred word. We find the gospel in many places, in songs, poems, and sometimes in un unexpected places. This piece spoke to me during this troubling time. It's Angel Down, written by Lady Gaga. I confess that I am lost in the age of the social, on our knees to take a test, to be loving and grateful. Shots were fired on the street by the church where we used to meet. Angel down, angel down, but the people just stood around. I'm a believer, it's a trial, foolish and weaker. Oh, oh I'd rather say. Will you pray with me? God of infinite mystery, bless the voice of the psalmist in our hearing and in our telling. Bless my words and the spaces between my words, that there may be a word for all who gather here today, needing your presence. Amen. The psalms in the Bible as Bonnie shared, are prayers of lament, praise, confusion, and hope. They represent the universal story of the soul's journey through life. As we listen to this morning's psalm, 
Whose voice are we hearing? Who is crying out, long enough, God? The title of this psalm says, A Song of David, and I suspect most of us hear a male voice when we read this psalm. But I offer that is more likely a woman's voice, a woman's lament. Perhaps it is Hagar in the desert with Ishmael, or Jochebed when she places Moses, her three-month-old son, in the river to keep him safe. Or maybe it's Mary's voice as she witnesses the persecution and death of her son Jesus at the hands of the oppressors. Long enough, God. Whose voice is calling to us now? I believe it is the voices of mothers of color. Mothers like Hagar, Jochebed, and Mary. Listen. I've carried this ton of trouble, lived with a stomach full of pain. Long enough, my arrogant enemies have looked down their noses at me. Take a good look at me, God, my God. I want to look life in the eye so no enemy can get the best of me or laugh when I fall on my face. Long enough, God. I invite you to turn and listen to the voices crying out this lament. The women who have held families together, held on tightly to their faith, mourn their sons and yell at God to see them, see their children, and answer the question, how long, Lord, how much longer? I invite you this morning to turn with me to the Black Madonna, an archetype of longing and darkness during this troubled time in our nation. Turn to her and listen. My first encounter with the Black Madonna was through reading Sue Monk Kidd's book, The Secret Life of Bees. I was intrigued by the wooden statue of a black woman, her right hand raised with a clenched fist. The community of which she had emerged was a community of slaves. She was dragged out of the mud and placed in their praise house. The community worshiped this icon as Mary, the mother of Jesus. The story continues that the master, unhappy about what Mary was encouraging the slaves to do, run away, took the statue and chained her in the carriage house. Each morning, she was back in the praise house. The community named her Our Lady of Chains, not because she wore chains, but because she continued to break free of them. I became curious about this figure, the Black Madonna. Was it just a fictional depiction rendered by the author? Well, a few months after I read the book, I received a summer catalog of classes at Pacific School of Religion. And there it was, a course on the longing for darkness, the Black Madonna. Who knew? So began my study of the Black Madonna. The Black Madonna is found throughout Europe, Sicily, Spain, Switzerland, France, Poland, Czechoslovakia, as well as in Turkey and Africa. In Asia, she is known as Tara, in India, Kali. Isis is identified as the Black Madonna. She is also known as Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico and is referred to as the Brown Madonna. The Black Madonna can also be seen at the entrance to the San Francisco airport, where she holds the image of St. Francis. The Black Madonna is an archetype which is defined as a reoccurring symbol or motif. Archetypes come and go according to the deepest, often unconscious, needs of the psyche, both personal and collective. An archetype, by definition, is not about just one thing. They may mean different things in different historical periods and different cultural settings. So why is the Black Madonna reemerging at this time, and what powers does she bring with her? Why do we need the Black Madonna today? I believe the reemergence of the Black Madonna archetype offers many gifts to us, 
and this morning I will highlight three. These are more than gifts, they are challenges. She comes to shake us up and to guide us through darkness and the inner process of transformation. Number one, the Black Madonna calls us into the darkness. Darkness is something we need to become accustomed to again. The Enlightenment has deceived us into being afraid of the dark and distance ourselves from it. Light switches are illusory. They need, they feed the notion that we can master nature and overcome all darkness with a flick of our finger. The Black Madonna invites us into the dark and therefore into our depths what mystics call the inside of things or the essence of things. It is where divinity lies. It is where illusions are broken apart and the truth is revealed. The Black Madonna calls us into that darkness which is mystery itself. She encourages us to be at home there in the presence of deep, black, unsolvable mystery. To honor this darkness is to honor the experience of people of color. It is the opposite of racism. The Black Madonna invites us to examine our racial biases, racial fears and projections and go into the dark. It is a dark time in our nation and we need to stay there, wrestle with what has served us well on the backs of people of color. We are called to do more than pray, shed tears, stand in protest, take a knee, or join a book study. We need to commit ourselves, our congregation, to anti-racism work, including the examination of our own liturgies, hymns, practices, and the interpretation of scripture. We need to lament our complicity in the system that continues to oppress. Two, the Black Madonna calls us to grieve. The Black Madonna is the sorrowful mother, the mother who weeps for the suffering in the universe, the suffering in the world, the brokenness of our very vulnerable hearts. In the Christian tradition, she holds the dying Christ in her lap, but this Christ represents all beings. It is the cosmic Christ, not just the historical Jesus that she is embracing. For all beings suffer, and the Black Madonna, the Great Mother, knows this and empathizes with us in our pain. She embraces us as a tender mother would, for compassion is her special gift to the world. The Black Madonna invites us to enter into this grief Name it and be there to learn what suffering has to teach us. She calls us to enter into the depths of our pain, suffering, and shared grief, not to run from it or cover it up with a variety of activities. Transformation cannot happen unless we pay attention to the grieving heart. Only by passing through grief can creativity burst forth anew. She calls us to the depth of transformation for social, economic, gender, and racial justice, and the struggles that must be maintained to carry on solidarity with the oppressed of any kind. In his book, Return of the Mother, Andrew Harvey writes, the Black Madonna provides an immense force of protection, an immense alchemical power of transformation through both grief and joy. She is an immense inspiration to compassionate service and action in the world. Three, the Black Madonna calls us to diversity. There is no imagination without diversity. Imagination is about inviting disparate elements into the soul and culture so that new combinations can make love together and new beings can be birthed. Because the Black Madonna is black, she addresses the fundamental phobia around race and differences of color and culture that come with race and ethnic diversity. Meister Eckhart writes, all the names we give to God 
come from an understanding of ourselves. To give God the name Black Madonna is to honor blackness and all people of color and eliminate our excessive whiteness of soul and culture. Divinity is diverse in color, traditions, and gender. God is mother, not just father. God is black, not just white. The Black Madonna calls us to the very heart of Jesus' ministry. We are called to take a second and third look at the Beatitudes, Jesus' beautiful descriptions of our community's brokenness and our call to lift up the lowest among us. She calls us to become prophets for the truth to be spoken. We are the body of Christ. We, as the body of Christ, must be committed to the vision of liberation that Jesus lays out in his gospel. Our model for this transformation was started in a synagogue in the Galilee, where Jesus unfurled the text from Isaiah and read to those who gathered, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Beloved community, we are the ones we have been waiting for. No one else is coming. We have to stop waiting for some transformative leader to emerge. It is you and me and all of us. All of us with our flaws and fears and doubts and brokenness and downright utter humanness. We are called to do more. As the body of Christ, we have been chosen for this time, this place, this moment in human history. We have been given a mandate, blessed with grace, surrounded with love, to wage peace, demanding equality and justice for all. To accomplish this, we, must, we will have to do something that our tradition, with its reliance on intellectualism, doesn't do well. We will have to follow the urgings of the Black Madonna. We will have to be sensitive when she cries out, particularly when she uses the oppressed and poor as the embodiment of her presence. Leaving behind our safe space of privilege and power take practice. It will require hard work. It will take courage. The amount of pain you're going to have to hold in your heart will grow bigger and almost unbearable. But we have no choice. As Rabbi Tarpon in the Ethics of Sages said, you are not obligated to complete the task, nor are you free to abandon it. We are a community of the called. We are women and men who come from very different places, but we each believe we have heard a call. We have heard the mystical voice and we must answer. It is our responsibility to fight for freedom for all, to love each other and support each other. We must be willing to step up and break the chains that have held others from fully being free. We must listen to the voices of the mothers. Lucinia Floyd, Tamika Palmer, Palmer, and Wanda, Wanda Cooper Jones, just to name a few, calling us into the depths and the grief with a vision of diversity, rebirth, and transformation. Our Lady of Change is reemerging to lead us to a new way of being, a new world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Beverly, for that beautiful talk, the reminder of the Black Madonna, the power that's there, the depths, the invitations. Thank you for the challenge and for the comfort. And now it is time for prayers for our beloved community. 
For those of you that are online and watching this, if you would like to type things into the chat space with whatever format you're reading, we would welcome those. In addition, uh, imagine yourself rising up in your chairs and coming up into our sanctuary, surrounded by your peace family as we say these prayers for each other and for the world. Oh, great love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and blessings. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our world. Today, we ask for continued prayers for Lynn and Bill Walton's son, Johnny, who was in urgent care for a bad sinus infection, and there is concern how this affects his kidney and dialysis. We pray for Peter Martin, son of Mary Grace Brook, and Peter Sidlowski, who is stepping out to improve his situation in taking a hopefully positive risk in his new career. Anna and Michael Citrino ask for prayers for their niece and nephews living in Colombia, facing challenges of growing up, as well as their great nephew, Victor, who is living in Kentucky. We pray for the Blackburn's nephew, Elias, beginning a new job since getting clean and their niece, Sydney, who is lonely and trying to go back to school. We send prayers to Ella, who is sad about celebrating her upcoming birthday away from home. For our Peace family going through this time of transition, we ask for prayers. May our search committee be blessed with wisdom in finding and selecting our settled pastor. May a bridge minister arrive with ease, and may our church family be safe and healthy. Congratulations to the most recent class of interfaith, interfaith ministers at the Chaplaincy Institute. They were ordained yesterday, virtually, Saturday, June 27th. Prayers for all who must go to the streets to walk and speak for economic justice and dignity of equality for our African American sisters and brothers. Prayers that we may each be inspired and challenged to be part of the birth of a new reality in our country. And for all who suffered from COVID-19 and racism, and all those who have suffered great losses from both. And we also pray for those who have been overlooked because of all the attention being given to pandemic and racism, all those who suffer. Knowing you are hearing us better than we are speaking, we offer these prayers in all the holy names of God. And so it is. Amen. 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 And now it's time that we gather together for communion. You're already up here. <laughs> As Bonnie already asked you to come and be around the communion table. So I think, Stu, I'm going to have to move a little bit. We come to that time where Jesus gathered with his disciples, followers of Jesus, men, women, children. I'm sure there were animals there. And he knew somewhere in his being that his life was going to be taken from him. And I keep on thinking that the disciples who had walked this journey with Jesus might want to revenge Jesus' death. And perhaps that's why Jesus said he was going to create this ritual so that they always could go back to that and remember what they had taught and what they had learned together. So he took something very common. He took bread. And we're going to try to do communion together today, so I'm not touching it. He gave God thanks for it. And he said, at least the Bible said, he said, this is my body broken for you. 
But I like to think that it's broken open for all of us, for the healings of our wounds, for the hope for tomorrow, that the brokenness begins to heal through God's love and through God's forgiveness. And then he took a cup, again, giving God thanks for it. And I believe he said, this is God's love poured out for each and every one of us. And as we share the cup and we share the bread, God's love flows through each one of us, one person to the next. So this is the bread of life and the cup of blessing, and let us all say, L'chaim. L'chaim. Thanks be to God. Was 
each other to walk together in all God's ways as the holy is revealed to us to give ourselves freely and without reserve to Jesus ministry in this church to celebrate through worship God's amazing gifts of unity and diversity to take up Christ's mission around the world striving for justice and peace to care for the earth and all her creatures, reconciling ourselves to them in love. For God gives immeasurable grace into all life and every life. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding be with you this week. And I remind you to listen to look and listen for the Black Madonna in your community. What are those mothers, mothers of color, trying to teach us? Amen. <laughs>